Hello, everyone, and welcome to Security in the 21st Century. I'll be your host, Dr. Suzanne Loftus. This video podcast series aims to look at the most pressing security-related challenges in the realm of international relations. It will feature interviews with professionals from academia, international organizations, the private sector, and government. The aim is to try to tie these sectors together into answering questions related to themes such as great power competition, disinformation campaigns, and transatlantic security. So stay tuned. everyone and welcome to Security in the 21st Century, a video podcast series addressing the most prominent security issues of our day in the realm of international studies. We are pleased to have on the show with us today Ms. Algirdi Pipikaite from the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland. Algirdi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Suzanne, for having me. Algirde is the cybersecurity lead for industry solution at the World Economic Forum. Algirde, if you could please tell us a little bit about the activities of the World Economic Forum. What are its main objectives? What does it primarily do? As well as your department within the organization. Thank you, of course, with pleasure, Susan. Um, as you may know, the World Economic Forum is an international organization for public-private collaboration. And we've been focusing for the last 50 years on bringing public sector and private sector, as well as civil society leaders together to tackle global challenges. Um, we focus on providing a platform for better collaboration and for actually meaningful dialogues and actions um, that will shape the future of our society. Um, we work on challenges like cybersecurity, digital trust, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, technology and society, the future of work are some of our themes for focus. Um, specifically myself, I am with the Center for the Cybersecurity um, and Digital Trust, or as we call at the World Economic Forum, um, the platform for shaping the future of cybersecurity and digital trust. Um, my personal work focus on investment and technology leaders, in working with them together, bringing them together, in actually developing a better path and a framework to ensure that the next generation technology is developed with security and privacy features as a focus. How can we ensure um, that the next generation technology does not introduce more vulnerabilities, but rather secures us from the get-go? That sounds very interesting and very useful in today's world, especially. I saw that you published a couple of articles recently. Algirde's articles are available on the World Economic Forum's website. And uh, while reading them, I had a few questions. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more with our audience today, what trends have you noticed have become more apparent in the cyber domain as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic that is affecting us all these days? Well, I'm glad to hear at least someone is reading the articles. So thank you, Susan. Um, it was actually an interesting revelation, um, observing the changes in society and at the same time, the increased dependency on technology that the COVID-19 pandemic brought on us. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, as we tend to joke, every organization had their digital transformation plan that was five-year plan or two-year plan, and suddenly within a couple of weeks or even one week, they had to implement it to ensure that they can continue connecting with their customers, with their clients, with their patients, and as well as their workforce, because literally almost every organization has shifted their working model to working from home. Mm 
mm -hmm. and has enforced it for safety and security reasons of their employees and their customers. What we have noticed in the last five um, or four months in this massive digital transformation and increased dependency on technology is that actually cyber attackers have not been sleeping. They being transformed and um, looking very particularly focused onto COVID-19 pandemic and using that as one of their main methods to access corporate or government networks. Um, even before COVID-19, social engineering attacks were around, have, uh, have amounted to around 98% of all attacks. So basically, if I can socially engineer anything around Susan Loftus and make it very personalized service, so think about a concierge hacking service, I get to know everything about you, I get to know everything about your organization, I get to know about your habits, um, about your patterns online, it is really much easier to get into either your corporate or your organizational network through your own human vulnerabilities mm -hmm. then to develop a technical vulnerability knowing what what platform you're using what operating system you're using and then look through those vulnerabilities okay so as if you put a hacking hat you always look for vulnerabilities in humans because it's just much easier to go and fish that way and what we've seen happening in the last couple of months is that the amount of hacking and cyber hackers organizations, criminal organizations, have not increased. But the attacks have multiplied by, by multiple folds. Mm -hmm. And what they're focused on is going after COVID-19 vulnerability, if you may. So sending false information or sending false email related to COVID-19 or putting false websites because people are so hungry for more information or at least to understand what's going on. Um, especially think, think back in March, April, when it was such a novelty, the whole pandemic process, that people were looking for resources and for news and for information anywhere. And that's where hackers actually tailored their hacking methods over um, the COVID-19 information. Um, so that actually has increased on enormous levels. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an interesting pattern to see as well, as people have moved to work from home, and in many cases use their work device for a lot of personal stuff, that division between professional life and personal work kind of vanished. Um, but at the same time, we are not enjoying the same security layers as we enjoy in our physical office. So how can organizations, and especially the chief security officers, ensure that you are as employee still secure at your home environment as you are at the office? Those are the challenges that we are working on right now. Well, at least someone is, uh, is taking care of these threats because, uh, as you said, it's very challenging to adapt to this new way of living. Uh, lots of people, as you mentioned, are working from home and cyber attackers are certainly going to take as much advantage of all the weaknesses that we allow them to. So thanks to your entire department for working hard on this. Um, my second question for you would be, what are some of the future challenges in the realm of cybersecurity that we are likely to face? So not only as a result of COVID-19, but in the future to come. Of course. So I think, you know, twofold, two, two challenges that we are seeing and growing very rapidly. One is because, as I mentioned before, our kind of the division between professional and personal life is diminishing. And we are obliged to be online at least eight hours a day due to our working commitment. And then we spend, you know, at least a couple more hours for our personal benefit. That means more time online, more time to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that applies to almost all population that is connected. So we have more time to make mistakes. At the same time, we are introducing digitalization at enormous pace. 
um, if you think that around 130 new IoT devices are connected every second globally, that means every minute we are connecting around roughly 8,000 new devices. In if, let's say, our interview will last for 30 minutes, in those 30 minutes, we will have around 230, 250,000 new devices connected. That means we are not only spending more time online, but we are multiplying the attack surface through our watches, through our headphones, through our mouses, through our laptops, and all other devices that are connected, including cars and refrigerators and airplanes and ships and all the supply chain that you think of. In, in thinking through the realm that digitalization is getting into our physical world, that's where we start talking about the actual safety concerns. So if, if your car is being hacked, now it's safety to not only passengers, not only driver, but also the surrounding environment. If our cities are getting connected, we have all buildings that are dependent on digital features, them working correctly or not. How do we ensure that hackers do not connect into skyscrapers and don't overheat them because they shut down the whole AC system? Um, how do we ensure that planes are flying securely, that um, ships are moving securely and the GPS are not being hacked to actually track them or misguide them and maybe collide them? So when you think about the digital threats moving into physical environment, and then you think about COVID-19, think about all the healthcare devices that are connected and that are actually becoming a threat to human health and to human safety and actually life. Um, I think anyone that is thinking about a future career should definitely consider cybersecurity because it's not going anywhere. The threats are increasing the challenges are becoming much more interesting to actually tackle and think about and think through. And these will be the challenges that the leaders and experts will have to think in the next five, 10 and 20 years, because we do not have a digital uh, rollback plan. We're not going to go back to the age where pen and paper will rule the world. We will continue being digital and just more and more. Now, actually, our task has to be how do we ensure that digitalization does pose much more opportunities than threats? That's exactly right. The threats you mentioned sound very frightening. So in order to move into the digital world even more, I hope that all nations and societies can manage to safely protect themselves against uh, those horrors that you mentioned. A third question, what would be your advice for technology companies and for consumers in the near and long term? You know, advice is the same to companies and consumers, but I think the main driving force for, driving force for companies will be the actual awareness and demands from the consumers for more safety and security and privacy features. Um, multiple researches have shown in the last couple of years that the actual trust between consumers and technology companies is eroding, mm -hmm. is vanishing. How can we ensure as technology leaders that that is not the case? How can we ensure that we continue developing the fourth industrial revolution based on trust between businesses to businesses and between business and consumers? And that goes both ways. Companies have to strive for better balance of introducing new products and introducing security features into them from get-go. At the same time, consumers have to be much more aware, and actually I have to give more credit to the new generations that are coming up, even after the millennials, because they are much more aware, since they are digitally born, of how much privacy and security features are important in the digital environment. So my hope is, and that's what we've seen shifting in the market step by step, although not as fast as I'd like to see, is that demand from consumers and especially the youngsters is growing for security and privacy features. Now, we also see, um, you know, big supranational legislations like the GDPR and the European Union actually focusing on the consumer trust and the consumer privacy and security features and products. And I think that will become 
more and more important, especially considering the environment, as I mentioned before, where physical means digital. And suddenly it's not only domain of cybersecurity, but we are actually talking about human life, human security, and, and technological integrity to ensure that uh, it's safe to use technology that is digitally connected. Well, thank you for that. Um, and lastly, about your publication, if you could tell us a little bit more, how is a mass cyber attack likely to affect our societies on the short and long term? Susan, that's, that's a great question. Um, and that's, that's actually a question and a challenge that within cyber community we spent quite some time thinking about. It's kind of the like virologist where thinking and predicting that pandemic can happen. Um, and I'm pretty sure they felt very similar like the cyber folks that we in our security field play with these scenarios, but not necessarily the broader community um, wants to pay attention until it actually happens. And we've seen through, through recent history some massive breaches like WannaCry, not Petia, um, that were actually spreading like a wildfire. Um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and if I remember right, the WannaCry attack actually spread within three days into 250,000 devices around 150 countries. So it's, it's a massive scale because to spread between network or between device to device takes much less time than spreading virus between human to human. Um, we, the, the devices, the IoT devices, laptops and phones and any device that is connected to the internet, they are already connected. So you do not need to, um, to enable them to make sure that communication between other devices happens. And that communication can be good communication between devices and can be bad. So if, if your laptop starts working as a super spreader, if you may, that's what we learned from the pandemic, they can infect within minutes hundreds of other devices. And that attack could be actually deadly. If we think almost 20 years ago in 2003, the Slammer Sapphire Worm was doubling its size in approximately nine seconds. So that meant that in 10 minutes, it infected more than 75,000 devices and you know, more than 11 million devices in 24 hours. That means that attack of that scale could go globally in one day or three days and cripple five to 10% of global network. That would be deadly for economy, for healthcare facilities, for markets, for overall usage of internet and the way we work. And now imagine the scenario when we all work online as we are today, if suddenly we cannot connect and we cannot um, be online. And we've seen attacks on global corporations, for example, Maersk, and they're quite, global about, uh, quite vocal about it, how deadly it was for them. It took months to get back operational. And that's a lot of money, but a lot of good lessons learned that actually leaders that think about how to prepare and be better prepared for any potential attack of that scale or even smaller happening to their organizations, we should be listening to leaders that have experienced them and what are the lessons that they have learned and take them into account. Exactly. It definitely sounds like something that we must prioritize ASAP. So, Alagirde, thank you so much for telling us about your publications. To the audience, you can find her publications on the World Economic Forum website. I strongly recommend that you all uh, read a little bit about it a bit more and educate yourselves about cybersecurity because it's going to take a very prominent role in the next uh, decades and century to come. So, Changing topics a little bit, I'm very interested in the World Economic Forum's concept of the fourth industrial revolution. This is something that's very important for um, societies, people, governments, academia to really try and understand uh, for the way that we're going to reorganize our societies in the future economically. 
What could you tell us about the fourth industrial revolution and what that means for the future of work for our societies? So the fourth industrial revolution um, has been developed as a concept by our founder, Klaus Schwab. Um, and, and he has observed the tendencies within our society in the last couple of decades um, and has actually identified that this digital revolution, if you may, um, is, not, is not something temporary. It's something that will stay with us for the long term. Um, and it will shape and is shaping our society, um, public and private sector, as the three other um, revolutions have shaped our lives before, industrial revolutions have shaped before. The current one, on the other hand, the fourth industrial revolution is happening on a much faster scale because it's digital. Anything that we are moving digital is just de facto moves much faster, changes our habits much faster. And if you think about the generations that are born, you know, since the 2000s, they do not envision life anymore without the digital environment, without being connected either on their iPads or phones or social media sites, that actually that's how, that's how it drives all of their interaction, which is not even very common to us who were born in the 90s or 80s. So just a couple of years difference make a massive change. And that shows how quickly everything is changing. What it means, especially for the labor markets, is the upcoming and ongoing, actually, disruption. And we've seen that already even much more um, challenging our ways of thinking of labor and workforce since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, think about the, the jobs that we thought were secured for humans because of thinking processes, because of critical analytical capabilities that only humans we thought possess. Currently, we've seen automation and orchestration features of the new machines actually taking over and being even more precise than the human abilities. Memory is nobody would ever dispute anymore that human memory is better than the computer memory. I think we are past that. What does it mean now to government leaders and private sector leaders when they think about how to develop their organizations for the future and how to develop them with human in mind? Okay, And that's what we need to think and provide this platform for public and private leaders to actually think of these challenges because these massive big societal changes will not be solved by one side. So we are here as the World Economic Forum to actually provide that platform to help leaders from both sectors to think of better ways to collaborate, of better ways of and ideas and visions of how we involve and provide humans with better skill sets to respond to these upcoming challenges. That's going to be absolutely vital uh, as we transition to automation, especially. Um, and then this COVID-19 pandemic, I find, has really just accelerated all the pre-existing uh, trends that were already in motion. The World Economic Forum is also working on the concept of the Great Reset. Would you mind telling us a little bit what that means? I would love to. <laughs> Great. So as, as you just said, COVID-19 pandemic actually has magnified our social injustices that we might have seen mushrooming in our society and actually spotlighted shocking disparities between different classes, if I may. Um, and now more than ever, it actually presented an opportunity for global leaders, for regional leaders and for national leaders to have this window to rethink, to refocus on society and refocus on actually their citizens, employees, humans, and resetting our social contract for the better. And that's what the World Economic Forum currently is focusing on, is providing this platform for more than 1,500 leaders globally from all regions of the world to think about the new contract of jobs, 
renew jobs, renew workforce development? How do we revive growth during pandemic and post pandemic? And how do we rethink the direction and priorities of our economy and societies and education system to respond to these upcoming challenges? And actually, we strongly believe that even the nature of business models might change. And in, including the climate change, how do we need to think about the global shared resources? So in all this, what we are focusing on with our leaders and our participants is how do we focus the great reset on human? Mm -hmm. um, and that's been our bread and butter in the last months, thinking through that and providing platform to our leaders to actually bring ideas and collaborate. Well, that's absolutely relevant. And thanks to the World Economic Forum for all that they do. Some of the goals of this video podcast series really is to interview different professionals from different sectors. So we have international organizations, government, academia, and really just interview them on their areas of expertise, but also to try to tie in the podcast with some questions that we in the security sector have been focusing on greatly uh, these days. So these main themes of importance to us are great power competition, the transatlantic alliance, and um, the domain of um, disinformation campaigns, which have been very destructive as of late. So we'd like to ask all of our interviewees to share their opinions and views on the, on the themes that I just mentioned, but of course tailored to um, you know, your area of expertise. Sure. So how would you see great power competition, which is defined as the competition between Russia, the United States and China predominantly today, how do you see this competition unfolding in the cyber domain in the near long-term future? That's actually a great question, and I would love to hear what, uh, what other leaders of their specific sectors think of that. Um, from my point of view, I think I tend to simplify a lot of things, at least in my brain. And for me, there is no surprise that great powers and great companies and, and societies are competing. It was, it's what drives our development. It's what drives our evolution. It's competition. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have observed in the last 20, 30 years is that a lot of physical realm has shifted into digital. Think about healthcare, think about you know, overall technology revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. Think about national security, trade, logistics, education. Almost everything has shifted to digital and has a cyber component of it. And it is just a normal evolution that as we have shifted our operations um, and business and public sectors operations online um, to cyber domain, so did our competition. So if you want to stay relevant, if you want to stay competitive, if you want to stay attractive, to investment, to your own citizens, and to um, and open, you know, your society to new challenges and new opportunities. How to tackle them? Of course, you are investing into technology, into cyber, into artificial intelligence, into quantum computing, into all technologies that are of the future or of today, um, and. Competition will always be with us. I embrace competition. I think that drives the market. It drives our development as a human uh, nature. And I think seeing that happening on a global scale and regional scale is just welcoming. Well, it's nice to hear a refreshing point of view about that as we often hear doom and gloom opinions, but it's certainly true that a little competition never hurt anyone to progress and develop as a, as a society and as a world at large. So how about in terms of the transatlantic alliance, so between Europe and North America, how are we likely to see their collaboration in terms of cybersecurity defense in the near future? Do you think they're more likely to resort to their own ways and means to, to secure their defenses, or are they more likely to work together to achieve 
defense against, say, other malign actors? And what would be your recommendations for them? So the transatlantic relations are very dear and near to my heart. I'm right. Lithuanian um, who was educated in Switzerland and United States, worked on both continents. Um, I love seeing, you know, um, all the collaboration on transatlantic level and on global level. Um, the only thing I can hope for, and the World Economic Forum can hope for, and any other organization can hope for, is that the collaboration, closer collaboration between um, the governments and law enforcement, especially the law enforcement agencies of um, both sides, will become closer and tighter. The challenge that I am seeing and we are seeing in the cybersecurity community is that actually hackers are communicating and trusting each other's and, and, and the hacking criminal groups are trusting each other and exchanging information at a light speed. While if you think about the law enforcement actions um, and about any government and private sector interaction, it is extremely slow. We are talking about different jurisdictions. We are talking about different laws, legal systems. We are talking about different court systems, different expectations, different even differences in digital preparedness of law enforcement agencies. All that actually put a lot of obstacles on better collaboration within the transatlantic community, within the countries themselves, and then within regions. So if, if you think of all the hoops that, for example, a German law enforcement authority needs to jump through to get a Spanish law enforcement authority to provide them with information on hacking activity or a criminal group and, you know, related information, it takes not days, it takes weeks. That time frame for a cyber criminal group is a time of benefit. It's the time that they are not getting caught. It's the time that they are just roaming around free and doing their bad activities as nothing is happening. Another very big disappointment is seeing that actually less than 1% of cyber crimes are being resolved. We are talking about the attribution and then actually even having hackers, you know, put, um, make them pay for what they have done, okay? Make them responsible. So considering that that percentage is so low, it's extremely low, it is very easy to go to the dark side and hope you will never get caught. And that hope drives the increase, the enormous increase in cyber activities and cyber criminal activities. So my hope and my only advice is that we will collaborate much closer not only on the transatlantic level, on government levels, but also between public and private sector collaboration. And that's what the platform for shaping the future of cybersecurity and digital trust is actually spending a lot of time focusing. How can we provide a better and faster way for the good actors to collaborate so we can tackle the bad actors faster? We certainly need some collaboration and uh, common defense practices to be able to ward off malign actors who um, don't wish anyone well. And lastly, Algirde, if you could please tell us how um, the increase in cyber hacks are likely to affect disinformation campaigns and what challenges would that lead to for global security? As we're seeing a lot of you know, propaganda, fake news as it's called, and campaigns that are really influencing um, populations and societies in ways that we might not want them to be, for example. What could you tell us about that? Um, I think the only thing I, I would share with you what we observe, and I don't think that would be news to anyone, is that COVID-19 has been exploded left and right to create um, fake news, fake news stories, um, and, and, you know, try to gain attention for whatever reasons, to, to increase unrest, to enable the questioning of even, you know, your own government's actions, or to provide a new venue to getting more advertising dollars. So whatever the, the, the final 
uh, goal of the bad actors is um, the, the one uniting feature is that the COVID-19 pandemic has been exploited massively. Now, the one benefit that I have observed is actually these enormous misinformation campaigns have actually helped uniting um, the big technology platforms, especially social media platforms, into focusing and tackling um, the fake news, you know, topic that we've been on for the last four or five years. And the pandemic, because suddenly it's focused on human safety and human health, um, has united the efforts for finding solutions of actually how do we check, fact check? Um, what do we publish? What do we don't publish? And, uh, and it's been great to see collaboration between the big tech platforms as well as governments involved into working on that in that regard. So I am hoping that not only this pandemic, but also the future global challenges and regional challenges will allow us to look for these opportunities for better collaboration. Um, and we will always have Malin actors, as you've said, and they will always look for human and technological vulnerabilities. Now, we need to stay very vigilant and actually upfront and educate society on how to recognize uh, truth from false. And I think especially now that the schools have moved to digital, it is really important to start that even from kindergarten. If we are putting our kids online and we are providing them with tools that have to actually to disable the kids protection features on their iPads and on their um, laptops, we need also to spend time and educate them how to recognize uh, bad, false behaviors and messaging online. Um, and don't get me wrong, that does not apply only to kids. We as grown-ups do exactly the same mistakes because we are at the same path of learning right now. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning of interview, digitalization is not going anywhere. It's not, it's not leaving us. So now we need to think of processes of how to make sure that it stays our friend and provides us with opportunities and benefits rather than to make our lives much more challenging. And that's what every single technology developer needs to think about is how my technology, how my company um, does enable better human interaction, better features of privacy, security, truth, and trust. And how do I ensure that the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution do actually happen to the broader society how do I increase inclusion and equality through the services or a platform that I'm providing? And from my interaction with technology leaders, that's actually a lot on their minds, especially these days. And as you said, we're all at the same stage of learning. This is new for everyone and we all need to uh, do our part in um, you know, making society better and progress in, in a way that would be beneficial for all. Uh, Gerda, you've given us a lot to think about today. Uh, I want to thank you once again for taking your time to, to be with us and joining us. So thanks very much for that really fruitful and interesting interview. Thank you, Susan, for having me. It's always a pleasure to connect. Good luck with you. Thanks. And for our audience, thank you so much for tuning in to Security in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Suzanne Loftus. I hope you tune in for the next episode. 